437, Chapter 51 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 205. Welcome to Craplet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 437, That Time Again? This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello! Did you have a wonderful vacation? If you're listening in real time, I hope so. I had a very nice trip up to Syracuse, New York, where I got to see my little baby. He's seven months old now, my sister's new, still, well, new to me still, son. And he is a smiley thing. He got sick, so right before, I guess he got sick right before we got there. And then he, by the time we left, he was in pretty good shape. But boy, even when he's sick, his native state is smiling at you. How can you not love a kid who's like that? <sighs> so easy. So easy, except not. Because sleeping through the night and feeding them and having to carry them everywhere and all of that makes me really, really love my soon-to-be 13-year-old and 16-year-old. So if you have little kids... It gets easier. And then it'll get harder for a little while. And then it'll get easier again, pretty much in that order. (laughs) And then they'll be in their 20s. And that's a completely different ball of wax. Today, for you, I have an interestingly pivotal chapter. There's no crafty chat for this week. It was just way too complicated getting back from the holidays and all of that. So we'll have craftiness next week. But. This week, I am not going to tell you the name of the chapter. Instead, I'm going to let you guess the name of the chapter. At some point during the first half of it, I will anticipate you're going, oh, write down your thought at that moment, if you can, if you can get to a piece of paper, or do the, hey, Siri, take a memo, and get your idea down, and then check in after we finish the chapter and see if you were right. I'm sure you're going to be right. It's just kind of there. So we have a chapter that's, as I said, kind of pivotal. And interestingly so, it's one of those chapters where Dumas is really pulling out his Dickensian heartstrings. He's he's putting on the hat of Dickens before there was a Dickens. He's preceding Dickens by about 30 years at this point. And he's going to tug at the heartstrings and he's going to give you a a wonderful character that girls could aspire to be like. And most importantly, there's going to be a lot, a lot of foreshadowing. Lots and lots of little pieces get dropped all over this chapter. And the kind of chapter it looks like it's going to be at the beginning is not the kind of chapter that it winds up being by the end. It's almost like there's a transitional moment in the narrative midway through this chapter, where the the whole tone of it changes. And that's why I said it's kind of an interesting chapter. You don't often find the tugging at heartstrings chapters going into something more, well, honestly, more adult. Not that it's like adult content the way that we would think of that, but grown-up topics of discussion. So it's a long chapter. I'm not going to stand in your way any longer. I'm going to let you listen to the chapter And then we'll check our notes afterwards. All right, here you go. Chapter 51 About two-thirds of the way along the Faubourg Saint-Honoré, and in the rear of one of the most imposing mansions in this rich neighborhood, where the various houses vie with each other for elegance of design and magnificence of construction, extended a large garden, where the wide-spreading chestnut trees raised their heads high above the walls in a solid rampart, and with the coming of every spring scattered a shower of delicate pink and white blossoms into the large stone vases that stood upon the two square pilasters 
of a curiously wrought iron gate that dated from the time of louis twelfth this noble entrance however in spite of its striking appearance and the graceful effect of the geraniums planted in the two vases as they waved their variegated leaves in the wind and charmed the eye with their scarlet bloom had fallen into utter disuse the proprietors of the mansion had many years before thought it best to confine themselves to the possession of the house itself with its thickly planted courtyard opening into the faubourg saint honore and to the garden shut in by this gate which formerly communicated with a fine kitchen garden of about an acre for the demon of speculation drew a line or in other words projected a street at the farther side of the kitchen garden the street was laid out a name was chosen and posted up on an iron plate but before construction was begun it occurred to the possessor of the property that a handsome sum might be obtained for the ground then devoted to fruits and vegetables by building along the line of the proposed street and so making it a branch of communication with the faubourg saint honore itself one of the most important thoroughfares in the city of paris in matters of speculation however though man proposes money disposes from some such difficulty the newly named street died almost in birth and the purchaser of the kitchen garden having paid a high price for it and being quite unable to find any one willing to take his bargain off his hands without a considerable loss yet still clinging to the belief that at some future day he should obtain a sum for it that would repay him not only for his past outlay but also the interest upon the capital locked up in his new acquisition contented himself with letting the ground temporarily to some market gardeners at a yearly rental of five hundred francs and so as we have said the iron gate leading into the kitchen garden had been closed up and left to rust which bade fair before long to eat of its hinges while to prevent the ignoble glances of the diggers and delvers of the ground from presuming to sully the aristocratic enclosure belonging to the mansion the gate had been boarded up to a height of six feet true the planks were not so closely adjusted but that a hasty peep might be obtained through their interstices but the strict decorum and rigid propriety of the inhabitants of the house left no grounds for apprehending that advantage would be taken of that circumstance horticulture seemed however to have been abandoned in the deserted kitchen garden and where cabbages carrots radishes peas and melons had once flourished a scanty crop of lucerne alone bore evidence of its being deemed worthy of cultivation a small low door gave egress from the walled space we have been describing into the projected street the ground having been abandoned as unproductive by its various renters and had now fallen so completely in general estimation as to return not even the one half per cent it had originally paid toward the house the chestnut trees we have before mentioned rose high above the wall without in any way affecting the growth of other luxuriant shrubs and flowers that eagerly dressed forward to fill up the vacant spaces as though asserting their right to enjoy the boon of light and air at one corner where the foliage became so thick as almost to shut out day a large stone bench and sundry rustic seats indicated that this sheltered spot was either in general favour or particular use by some inhabitant of the house which was faintly discernible through the dense mass of verdure that partially concealed it though situated but a hundred paces off whoever had selected this retired portion of the grounds as the boundary of a walk or as a place for meditation was abundantly justified in the choice by the absence of all glare the cool refreshing shade the screen it afforded from the scorching rays of the sun that found no entrance there even during the burning days of hottest summer the incessant and melodious warbling of birds and the entire removal from either the noise of the street or the bustle of the mansion on the evening of one of the warmest days spring had yet bestowed on the inhabitants of paris might be seen negligently thrown upon the stone bench a book a parasol and a work basket from which hung a partly embroidered cambric handkerchief while at a little distance from these articles was a young woman standing close to the iron gate 
endeavouring to discern something on the other side by means of the openings in the planks the earnestness of her attitude and the fixed gaze with which she seemed to seek the object of her wishes proving how much her feelings were interested in the matter at that instant the little side gate leading from the waste ground to the street was noiselessly opened and a tall powerful young man appeared he was dressed in a common grey blouse and velvet cap but his carefully arranged hair beard and moustache all of the richest and glossiest black ill accorded with his plebeian attire after casting a rapid glance around him in order to assure himself that he was unobserved he entered by the small gate and carefully closing and securing it after him proceeded with a hurried step towards the barrier at the sight of him she expected though probably not in such a costume the young woman started in terror and was about to make a hasty retreat but the eye of love had already seen even through the narrow chinks of the wooden palisades the movement of the white robe and observed the fluttering of the blue sash pressing his lips close to the planks he exclaimed don't be alarmed valentine it is i again the timid girl found courage to return to the gate saying as she did so and why do you come so late to-day it is almost dinner-time and i had to use no little diplomacy to get rid of my watchful mother-in-law my too devoted maid and my troublesome brother who is always teasing me about coming to work at my embroidery which i am in a fair way never to get done so pray excuse yourself as well as you can for having made me wait and after that tell me why i see you in a dress so singular that at first i did not recognize you dearest valentine said the young man the difference between our respective stations makes me fear to offend you by speaking of my love but yet i cannot find myself in your presence without longing to pour forth my soul and tell you how fondly i adore you if it be but to carry away with me the recollection of such sweet moments i could even thank you for chiding me for it leaves me a gleam of hope that if you did not expect me and that indeed would be worse than vanity to suppose at least i was in your thoughts you asked me the cause of my being late and why i come disguised i will candidly explain the reason of both and i trust to your goodness to pardon me i have chosen a trade a trade oh maximilian how can you jest at a time when we have such deep cause for uneasiness heaven keep me from jesting with that which is far dearer to me than life itself but listen to me valentine and i will tell you all about it i became weary of ranging fields and scaling walls and seriously alarmed at the idea suggested by you that if caught hovering about here your father would very likely have me sent to prison as a thief that would compromise the honour of the french army to say nothing of the fact that the continual presence of a captain of spahis in a place where no warlike projects could be supposed to account for it might well create surprise so i have become a gardener and consequently adopted the costume of my calling what excessive nonsense you talk maximilian nonsense pray do not call what i consider the wisest action of my life by such a name consider by coming a gardener i effectually screen our meetings from all suspicion or danger i beseech you maximilian to cease trifling and tell me what you really mean simply that having ascertained that the piece of ground on which i stand was to let i made application for it was readily accepted by the proprietor and am now master of this fine crop of lucerne think of that valentine there is nothing now to prevent my building myself a little hut on my plantation and residing not twenty yards from you only imagine what happiness that would afford me i can scarcely contain myself at the bare idea such felicity seems above all price as a thing impossible and unattainable but would you believe that i purchase all this delight joy and happiness for which i would cheerfully have surrendered ten years of my life at the small cost of five hundred francs per annum paid quarterly 
Henceforth, we have nothing to fear. I am on my own ground, and have an undoubted right to place a ladder against the wall, and to look over when I please, without having any apprehensions of being taken off by the police as a suspicious character. I may also enjoy the precious privilege of assuring you of my fond, faithful, and unalterable affection whenever you visit your favourite bower, unless, indeed, it offends your pride to listen to professions of love from the lips of a poor working man clad in a blouse and cap. A faint cry of mingled pleasure and surprise escaped from the lips of Valentine, who almost instantly said, in a saddened tone, as though some envious cloud darkened the joy which illumined her heart, "'Alas, no, Maximilian, this must not be, for many reasons. We should presume too much on our own strength, and, like others, perhaps be led astray by our blind confidence in each other's prudence.' "'How can you for an instant entertain so unworthy a thought, dear Valentine? "'Have I not, from the first blessed hour of our acquaintance, "'schooled all my words and actions to your sentiments and ideas? "'And you have, I am sure, the fullest confidence in my honour. "'When you spoke to me of experiencing a vague and indefinite sense of coming danger, "'I placed myself blindly and devotedly at your service, "'asking no other reward than the pleasure of being useful to you. And have I ever since, by word or look, given you cause of regret for that having selected me from the numbers that would willingly have sacrificed their lives for you? You told me, my dear Valentine, that you are engaged to Monsieur d'Epinay, and that your father was resolved upon completing the match, and that from his will there was no appeal." as M. de Villefort was never known to change a determination once formed. I kept in the background, as you wished, and waited, not for the decision of your heart or my own, but hoping that Providence would graciously interpose in our behalf, and order events in our favour. But what cared I for delays or difficulties? Valentine, as long as you confess that you love me and took pity on me, if you will only repeat that avowal now and then, I can endure anything. Ah, oh, Maximilian, that is the very thing that makes you so bold, and which renders me at once so happy and unhappy, that I frequently ask myself whether it is better for me to endure the harshness of my mother-in-law and her blind preference for her own child, or to be as I now am, insensible to any pleasure save such as I find in these meetings, so fraught with danger to both. "'I will not admit that word,' returned the young man. "'It is at once cruel and unjust. Is it possible to find a more submissive slave than myself? You have permitted me to converse with you for time to time, Valentine, but forbidden my ever following you in your walks or elsewhere. Have I not obeyed?' and since I found means to enter this enclosure, to exchange a few words with you through the gate, to be close to you without really seeing you, have I ever asked so much as to touch the hem of your gown, or try to pass this barrier which is but a trifle to one of my youth and strength? Never has a complaint or a murmur escaped me. I have been bound by my promises as rigidly as any knight of olden times." "'Come, come, dearest Valentine, confess that what I say is true, lest I be tempted to call you unjust.' "'It is true,' said Valentine, as she passed the end of her slender fingers through a small opening in the planks, and permitted Maximilian to press his lips to them. "'And you are a true and faithful friend. But still you acted from motives of self-interest, my dear Maximilian.' "'For you well know that from the moment in which you had manifested an opposite spirit, "'all would have been ended between us. "'You promised to bestow on me the friendly affection of a brother. "'For I have no friend but yourself upon earth, "'who am neglected and forgotten by my father, "'harassed and persecuted by my mother-in-law, "'and left to the sole companionship of a paralyzed and speechless old man, "'whose withered hand can no longer press mine, and who can speak to me with the eye of alone, although there still lingers in his heart 
the warmest tenderness for his poor grandchild oh how bitter a fate is mine to serve either as a victim or an enemy to all who are stronger than myself while my only friend and supporter is a living corpse indeed indeed maximilian i am very miserable and if you love me it must be out of pity valentine replied the young man deeply affected i will not say you are all i love in the world for i dearly prize my sister and brother-in-law but my affection for them is calm and tranquil in no manner resembling what i feel for you when i think of you my heart beats fast the blood burns in my veins and i can hardly breathe but i solemnly promise you to restrain all this ardour this fervour and intensity of feeling until you yourself shall require me to render them available in serving or assisting you monsieur france is not expecting to return home for a year to come i am told in that time many favourable and unforeseen chances may befriend us let us then hope for the best hope is so sweet a comforter meanwhile valentine while reproaching me with selfishness think a little what you have been to me the beautiful but cold resemblance of a marble venus what promise of future reward have you made me for all the submission and obedience i have evinced none whatever what granted me scarcely more you tell me of monsieur franz d'epinay your betrothed lover and you shrink from the idea of being his wife but tell me valentine is there no other sorrow in your heart you see me devoted to you body and soul my life and each warm drop that circles around my heart are consecrated to your service you know full well that my existence is bound up in yours that were i to lose you i would not outlive the hour of such crushing misery yet you speak with calmness of the prospect of your being the wife of another oh valentine were i in your place and did i feel conscious as you do of being worshipped and adored with such a love as mine a hundred times at least should i have passed my hand between those iron bars and said take this hand dearest maximilian and believe that living or dead i am yours yours only and forever the poor girl made no reply but her lover could plainly hear her sobs and tears a rapid change took place in the young man's feelings dearest dearest valentine exclaimed he forgive me if i have offended you and forget the words i spoke if you have unwittingly caused you pain no maximilian i am not offended answered she but do you not see what a poor helpless being i am almost a stranger and an outcast in my father's house where even he is seldom seen whose will has been thwarted and spirits broken from the age of ten years beneath the iron rod so sternly held over me oppressed mortified and persecuted day by day hour by hour minute by minute no person has cared for me even observed my sufferings nor have i ever breathed one word on the subject save to yourself outwardly and in the eyes of the world i am surrounded by kindness and affection but the reverse is the case the general remark is oh it cannot be expected that one of the so stern a character as monsieur villefort could lavish the tenderness some fathers do on their daughters what though she has lost her own mother at a tender age she has had the happiness to find a second mother in madame de villefort the world however is mistaken my father abandons me from utter indifference while my mother-in-law detests me with a hatred so much the more terrible because it is veiled beneath a continual smile hate you sweet valentine exclaimed the young man how is it possible for any one to do that alas replied the weeping girl i am obliged to own that my mother-in-law's aversion to me 
arises from a very natural source, her overweening love for her own child, my brother Edward. But why should it? I do not know, but, though unwilling to introduce money matters into our present conversation, I would just say this much, that her extreme dislike to me has its origin there, and I much fear she envies me the fortune I enjoy in right of my mother, and which will be more than doubled at the death of Monsieur and Madame de saint Maron, whose sole heiress I am. Madame de Villefort has nothing of her own, and hates me for being so richly endowed. Alas, how gladly would I exchange the half of this wealth for the happiness of at least sharing my father's love. God knows, I would prefer sacrificing the whole so that it would obtain me a happy and affectionate home. Poor Valentine! I seem to myself as though living a life of bondage, yet at the same time I am so conscious of my own weakness that I fear to break the restraint on which I am held lest I fall utterly helpless. Then, too, my father is not a person whose orders may be infringed with impunity, protected as he is by his high position and firmly established reputation for talent and unswerving integrity. No one could oppose him. He is all-powerful even with the king. He would crush you at a word. Dear Maximilian, believe me when I assure you that if I do not attempt to resist my father's commands, it is more on your account than my own. But why, Valentine, do you persist in anticipating the worst? Why picture so gloomy a future? Because I judge it from the past. Still, consider that although I may not be, strictly speaking, what is termed an illustrious match for you, I am for many reasons not altogether so much beneath your alliance. The days when such distinctions were so nicely weighed and considered no longer exist in France, and the first families of the monarchy have intermarried with those of the empire. The aristocracy of the lance has allied itself with the nobility of the canon. Now I belong to this last-named class, and certainly my prospects of military preferment are most encouraging as well as certain. My fortune, though small, is free and unfettered, and the memory of my late father is respected in our country, Valentine, as that of the most upright and honourable merchant of the city. I say our country because you were born not far from Marseille. Don't speak of Marseille, I beg of you, Maximilian. That one word brings back my mother to my recollection. My angel mother, who died too soon for myself, and all who knew her, but who, after watching over her child during the brief period allotted to her in this world, now, I fondly hope, watches from her home in heaven. Oh, if my mother were still living, there would be nothing to fear, Maximilian, for I would tell her that I loved you, and she would protect us. I fear Valentine, replied the lover, that were she living, I should never have had the happiness of knowing you. You would then have been too happy to have stooped from your grandeur to bestow a thought on me. Now it is you who are unjust, Maximilian, cried Valentine. But there is one thing I wish to know. And what is that? inquired the young man, perceiving that Valentine hesitated. Tell me, truly, Maximilian, whether in former days, when our fathers dwelt at Marseille, there was ever any misunderstanding between them. Not that I am aware of, replied the young man, unless indeed any ill-feeling might have arisen from their being of opposite parties. Your father was, as you know, a zealous partisan of the Bourbon, while mine was wholly devoted to the emperor. There could not possibly be any other difference between them. But why do you ask? I will tell you, replied the young girl, for it is but right you should know. Well, on the day when your appointment as an officer of the Legion of Honour was announced in the papers, we were all sitting with my grandfather, 
Monsieur Noirtier. Monsieur Donglar was there also. Uh, you rec recollect Monsieur Donglar, do you not? Maximilian, the banker whose horses ran away with my mother-in-law and little brother, and very nearly killed them. While the rest of the company were discussing the approaching marriage of Mademoiselle Donglar, I was reading the paper to my grandfather, but when I came to the paragraph about you, although I had done nothing else but read it over to myself all the morning, you know you had told me all about it the previous evening, I felt so happy and yet so nervous at the idea of speaking your name aloud and before so many people that I really think I should have passed it over, but for the fear that my doing so might create suspicions as to the cause of my silence. So I summoned up all my courage and read it as firmly and as steadily as I could. Dear Valentine, well, would you believe it? Directly my father caught the sound of your name, he turned round quite hastily, and like a poor silly thing, I was so persuaded that everyone must be as much affected as myself by the utterance of your name that I was not surprised to see my father start and almost tremble. But I even thought, though that surely must have been a mistake, that Monsieur Donglar trembled too. "'Morel! Morel!' cried my father. "'Stop a bit!' Then knitting his brows into a deep frown, he added, "'Surely this cannot be one of the Morel family who lived at Marseille and gave us so much trouble from the violent Bonapartism, I mean about the year 1815.' "'Yes,' replied Monsieur Donglar. "'I believe he is the son of the old shipowner.' "'Indeed,' answered Maximilian. "'And what did your father say then, Valentine? "'Oh, such a dreadful thing that I don't dare to tell you.' "'Always tell me everything,' said Maximilian with a smile. "'Ah,' continued my father, still frowning, "'their idolized emperor treated these madmen as they deserved. "'He called them food for powder, which was precisely all they were good for.' and I am delighted to see that the present gouvernement have adopted this salutary principle with all its pristine vigour. If Algiers were good for nothing but to furnish the means of carrying so admirable an idea into practice, it would be an acquisition well worthy of struggling to obtain, though it certainly does cost France somewhat dear to assert her rights in that uncivilised country. "'Brutal politics, I must confess,' said Maximilian. "'But don't attach any serious importance, dear, to what your father said. "'My father was not a bit behind yours in that sort of talk. "'Why?' said he. "'Does not the emperor, who has devised so many clever and efficient modes of improving the art of war, "'organize a regiment of lawyers, judges, and legal practitioners, "'sending them in the hottest fire the enemy could maintain, "'and using them to save better men? "'You see, my dear,' that for picturesque expression and generosity of spirit, there is not much to choose between the language of either party. But what did Monsieur Donglas say to this outburst on the part of the procureur? Oh, he laughed, and in that singular manner so peculiar to himself, half malicious, half ferocious, he almost immediately got up and took his leave. Then, for the first time, I observed the agitation of my grandfather. And I must tell you, Maximilian, that I am the only person capable of discerning emotion in his paralyzed frame. And I suspected that the conversation that had been carried on in his presence, for they always say and do what they like before the dear old man without the smallest regard for his feelings, had made a strong impression on his mind. For, naturally enough, it must have pained him to hear the emperor he so devotedly loved and served "'spoken of in that depreciating manner.' "'The name of Monsieur Noirtier,' interposed Maximilian, "'is celebrated throughout Europe. "'He was a statesman of high standing, "'and you may or may not know, Valentine, "'that he took a leading part in every Bonapartist conspiracy "'set on foot during the restoration of the Bourbon. "'Oh, I have often heard whispers of things 
that seemed to me most strange. The father, a Bonapartist, the son, a Royalist, what can have been that reason of so singular a difference in parties and politics? But to resume my story, I turned towards my grandfather, as though to question him as to the cause of his emotion. He looked expressively at the newspaper I had been reading. "'What is the matter, dear grandfather?' said I. "'Are you pleased?' He gave me a sign in the affirmative. "'With what my father said just now?' He returned the sign in the negative. "'Perhaps you liked what Monsieur Donglar said?' "'Another sign in the negative.' "'Oh, then, you were glad to hear that Monsieur Morel, I didn't dare to say Maximilian, had been made an officer of the Legion of Honour? He signified assent. Only think of the poor old man's being so pleased to think that you, who were a perfect stranger to him, had been made an officer of the Legion of Honour. Perhaps it was a mere whim on his part, for he is falling, they say, into second childhood. But I love him for showing so much interest in you.' "'How singular!' murmured Maximilian. "'Your father hates me, while your grandfather, on the contrary, "'what strange feelings are aroused by politics!' "'Hush!' cried Valentine, suddenly. "'Someone is coming!' Maximilian leaped at one bound into his crop of lucerne, which he began to pull up in the most ruthless way, under the pretext of being occupied in weeding it. "'Mademoiselle! Mademoiselle!' exclaimed a voice from behind the trees. "'Madame is searching for you, everywhere, where there is a visitor in the drawing-room.' "'A visitor?' inquired Valentine, much agitated. "'Who is it?' "'Some grand personage, a prince, I believe they said, the Count of Monte Cristo.' "'I will come directly,' cried Valentine aloud. The name of Monte Cristo sent an electric shock through the young man on the other side of the iron gate to whom Valentine's I am coming, was the customary signal of farewell. "'Now then,' said Maximilian, leaning on the handle of his spade, "'I would give a good deal to know how it comes about that the Count of Monte Cristo is acquainted with Monsieur de Villefort.'" End of chapter 51 All right. What did you write down? If you wrote down Romeo and Juliet, I'm going to give you half credit. <laughs> and if you wrote down Pyramus and Thisbe, you win! Yay! Eternal craftlet brownie points for you. I, I know there's nothing I can give you through the podcast earbuds, but, but yay! Pyramus and Thisbe it is. Going back to Ovid's Metamorphoses, you get the story, the original story, well, original to us story of Pyramus and Thisbe, two young lovers separated by a wall. There is a crack in the wall. They live next door to each other, but their parents hate each other. Now you see the Romeo and Juliet part. They talk to each other through the crack in the wall. Finally, they get so sick of doing that, they decide to elope because that's, of course, the logical order of things. Oh, we haven't seen each other. We don't know each other very well. We've talked through a crack in the wall. Hey, let's get married. So they go off to get married. They have a plan. They're going to meet on the outskirts of town. Thisbe goes first. For reasons that we do not know, Pyramus is delayed. Thisbe gets to the tomb outside of the city walls that they are supposed to meet at. And at the tomb, there is a lioness. And she's just killed some beastie beast. And she's got blood dripping from her jaws. And Thisbe freaks out and screams and run away, and she runs away so fast that she drops her shawl. The lioness, a curious beast, comes over, mauls the shawl, <laughs> a little bit, getting the blood all over it. Now is when Pyramus shows up and sees the bloody shawl. Oh, oh, my breaking heart. Here, let me break it for real. And he stabs himself in the heart. Right around now, Thisbe shows back up, having reclaimed her courage. She stalwartly goes back to the site of the lioness, where she is supposed to meet Pyramus. And lo and behold, there he is, dying. He sees her for a brief moment and says, Oh, wow, you're not dead. I am. Ugh. And she is so upset, she then takes his sword and stabs herself. 
in the heart. A bloody end to a love story. There are all sorts of jokes that could be inserted there. I'm just going to let you do that right now. You can insert joke here. Dumas did not think you were not going to get that. Dumas is also, like I said before, really laying on a bunch of foreshadowing in this chapter. And he's dropped a lot of names as part of it. People who we didn't think were very important before, perhaps, hmm, are now getting mentioned hundreds of pages later. We're going to go over those in just a second. But the Pyramus and Thisbe thing, if you know the story, what are you expecting to happen next to Maximilian and to Valentine? Right. We're expecting them to die. It's just the way that our brains would work is if we recognize that story for the illusion that it is, then we're going to go, oh, wow. Oh, wow. They're doomed. Oh, that's so sad because they actually really seem pretty cool together. They have their sloppy moments, right? They're, oh, I love you. But they actually seem like they get along really well. She speaks to him not like a cowering little girl. She actually does kind of stand up to him a couple of times and she gives him a couple of really good humorous prods, eh, eh, kind of poking at him to make him laugh or to make him love her more. So they have this great relationship. Now we're thinking, oh, darn it. Here it looked like someone was going to be able to be happy. Well, aside from the Pyramus and Thisbe thing, we don't have any other reason to think that these two are doomed until Valentine starts telling the story of reading the newspaper account about Maximilian getting his award in front of her father. Did you find it interesting that Viafor and Danglars were sitting at the table together? Did you find it interesting that Valentine is supposed to marry Franz, Franz de Penet? This is the guy who was in Rome with Albert. And we also heard a reference to Danglars' daughter's upcoming marriage or arrangement that the, she's fianced. This is news. We've heard Franz mentioned in absentia several times before, but now he's off, as we recall, still seeing the sights, hanging out for a year or two, all the while knowing that he's coming home to someone who's betrothed to him. And that's part of why he was so kind of low-key about the whole traveling around and taking his time kind of thing, because when he comes back, he's going to be tied down, man. He's just not going to be that freewheeling man anymore. He's going to have to, he's going to have to step up and, you know, walk the narrow line of behavior, which he may or may not be very good at. It's kind of hard to tell right now. But Franz gets mentioned, V4, Danglar, Danglar's daughter, and Monsieur Noitier. And we have to go way back, way back to remember what Noitier was like with his son, V4, when they were still back in Marseille. Do you remember how hot-headed he was and how, how absolutely willing to rip into his son Noitier was? And now he's living in Vifor's house, having had some kind of a paralyzing stroke. And the only person who's bothered to learn how to communicate with him is Valentine. And lest you think this is, you know, there's movie-wasting disease, but then there's also movie magical transference of information where people just kind of know things. This is not that. Dumas has devised a system, and it may honestly have been a system that was in use at the time. It is genius. We will get there when we get there, but you will get an explanation for why Valentine says, I can understand him. This is a really, really interesting turn of events, especially when you lay on top of it Vifor and Noitier's responses to Maximilian getting his award, his promotional thing. But I truly loved Maximilian's response to poor Valentine saying, and then my dad said, that's great, at least he's cannon fodder. And Maximilian, instead of taking offense, says, oh, it's okay. My dad always said <laughs> the best kind of army would be put the lawyers out front. It's very much that Shakespearean first I'd kill all the lawyers moment. And there it comes, this lightheartedness and, like his father, an inherent belief in the goodness of people. Now, on that note, there have been several mentions in the book so far to Algeria. 
or to Algiers, depending on which era you are living in and you're hearing it talked about. This started, interestingly enough, with Charles X and a financial arrangement gone sideways. It didn't go bad. It didn't get scuttled or anything like that. It went sideways. There were a couple of merchants. They hadn't gotten paid. The French government seemed to be in no great hurry to repay them. And it it was a big bill. It was like all the wheat that was needed to feed the French army for a year or something. I mean, it was a massive amount of wheat. So it was a lot of money. And, uh, And the French government was stalling. And things rolled on for years. And eventually there was a smackdown between the leader in Algiers, the day, D-E-Y, who's kind of like a a regional magistrate, kind of like a a governor, basically, I I think. And there was an incident with the day smacking a French official on the face with his fan or flyswatter, basically. That was a little provoking for the French at that time. And so Charles X put a blockade around the Algerian ports. That really only hurt the French because the Barbary pirates were able to get through the blockade. It was the French ships that couldn't get into trade. So it it affected French trade negatively. But Charles X was working very hard to distract people from the fact that the country was starting to fall apart again. And, you know, nothing nothing distracts like a good old-fashioned war. So that was a lot of the beginning of this conflict. Reminds me of the beginning of World War I, Same kind of thing where it seems to be this one pivotal moment, the shooting of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And yes, that's true. That's kind of the spark that lit the tinder. But the tinder was there and dry and ready to go for a long time with World War I. And the tensions had been rising for quite some time in Algeria as well. For Viafor to say, Algeria, great, let's send all those, those people, Maximilian, those people over there to get killed. The price may seem high, but, you know, whatever. As though people like Maximilian are a dime a dozen. I mean, really. But it is interesting because it is exactly the flip side of what Maximilian said to Valentine when she said, you know, there's, there's trouble between our families. I don't know what's going on. Oh. And Maximilian says, and I'm going to read to you first the Victorian translation, and then I'm going to read to you the modern Robin Bess translation because there are actually two places in this chapter where the translations differed in clarity enough that I thought I should bring them up. So first, Victorian version, Maximilian says, the days when such distinctions were so nicely weighed and considered no longer exist in France, and the first families of the monarchy have intermarried with those of the empire. The aristocracy of the lance has allied itself with the nobility of the canon. And he then goes on to say, and I belong to that last group, the the canon group. And so it's this very egalitarian idea that everybody got elevated, so nobody has to be shunned or looked down upon or separated out. As long as you've done something of value to your country, uh, you're on equal footing. And we know from before that that isn't how his class thinks. Now, in the, in the new version, the Robin Bess version, the translation was the time when there were two nations in France had passed, two nations being the rich and the poor. The leading families of the monarchy have melted into the families of the empire, and the aristocracy of the lance has married the nobility of the canon. It's a little more simple and straightforward, but that idea of it melting into the families of the empire... It's like the people of the empire were a giant Belgian waffle. And the nobility, the families of the monarchy, have been placed upon the waffle like a big, thick pat of butter. And it's just melting down into all the cracks and crevices. Or an English muffin or a crumpet. Same idea. That's an interesting way to put it, because that means that he's making very clear that the foundation of the country is the people, capital P, people. And the wealthy class, they're just kind of like the the frosting on the cookie. You don't really need it. The cookie's still the cookie. Everything else is just frosting. So that was one translation that I thought was interesting. The other translation is something that Valentine says. In the Victorian translation, and this is when she has started kind of 
the, the hardcore tugging on the heartstrings thing. She says, I seem to myself as though living a life of bondage, yet at the same time am so conscious of my own weakness that I fear to break the restraint in which I'm held, lest I fall utterly helpless. Now, that is, that is understandable if you rewind several times and go back and listen to it, or you're really super crazy smart. But I thought the Robin Buss translation of it is, again, a beautiful image. Yes, she says, I feel like someone bound, and at the same time so weak that it seems to me that my chains support me and I am afraid to break them. That's an incredible image, right? That's like if you took Marley's ghost and wrapped the chains around him, the chains would be the thing that's keeping him going rather than the thing that's dragging him down. That's a very different way to see chains or use chains or think about your own chains. You know, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know, which is part of why she's afraid to break them. But there's also this living in the culture that she lives in, in the world that she is cloistered into by virtue of her being a girl. The chains that restrict her are also the chains that really, realistically, are keeping her safe. And that is a sticky mess to get yourself out of. And in a sticky mess is where I'm going to leave you today. (laughs) We are done with the episode. I will be back next week with some crafty chat on Tuesday, if you can make it. We are still doing the weekly constitutional over on YouTube. There will be a link in the show notes if you are interested in going and listening to any of the conversations about the Constitution. And let's see, next week we're going to do the First Amendment with a First Amendment lawyer, somebody who actually knows stuff. If you have any questions that you want me to ask, you can email them to me at heather at craftlit.com or you can use the call-in line for Craftlit to send a question to our expert. That number is 306-250-1642. And with it being the second Friday of the month, I wanted to say a big thank you to our new Patreon patrons. They would be Juliet and Donna. I know the holidays are a hard time to support anyone except for your family, and I really, really appreciate those of you who stick with Craftlet and make it possible for me to make the podcast for you. All right, take care of yourself. Have a great week. I will talk to you actually rather soon. Take care. Bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlet.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. For nine years, Craftlet has been kept going by the support of you, the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.